Welcome to another edition of Marriage for Better for Worse. Hi, I'm Bob Moeller, your host. And for the next 30 minutes, we're going to look at relationship issues from a biblical perspective. Issues that uh, we have to wrestle with, or people you know have to wrestle with in this uh, difficult world in which we live in. But the Bible says, even though in this world we'll have tribulation, we should take heart, for Christ has overcome the world. Well, our topic for this program is going to be, how do I find healing after an abortion? How do I find healing, or can I find healing, after an abortion? We'll look at that topic a little bit closer in just a few minutes. Let me begin by saying I'm not a professional counselor or therapist or licensed uh, psychologist. I am a pastor who uses listening, caring, prayer, and God's Word to help people with uh, their relationship issues. Now, if you'd like to be part of this program, you can do so by uh, dropping us a note, an email with a question that you might want us to address, bob at forkeepsministries.com, bob at forkeepsministries.com. There's also a phone number at the bottom of the screen where you can leave on a pre-recorded or a recorded um, uh, message device a question that you might wish for us to answer at a future program as well. Well, let's jump into uh, this program's questions. And by the way, these are questions that I have formulated and written based on questions I have been asked or situations I have encountered throughout uh, my life of ministry, particularly to couples and singles. So. Let's begin with this question. When I was in high school, I was considered the model student in our church youth group. Everyone looked up to me and to my family. I made some bad choices and ended up getting pregnant in high school. But to avoid embarrassing my family, I chose to secretly have an abortion. Now that I'm married, my husband does not know about this chapter of my life. And uh, lately, we've been struggling in our marriage with one another. Could this episode or this problem from my past be impacting our present relationship? Do I need to share my secret with him? Well, the answer is yes, I do believe you need to. Marriage is a, a relationship in which honesty, openness, and transparency is the only pathway to intimacy. And when we are hiding, are failing to disclose something as significant as this, uh, it definitely can impact your marriage, particularly if you've not resolved that issue, if you've not found forgiveness, if you've not found healing. The Bible gives us a general principle for relationships that holds true at um, all times, all places, and particularly in this case. It's found in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says this, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Uh, you see, there's two things here that you need in your relationship. One is you need closer fellowship with your husband. You, you sense something's keeping you apart. And you also need a sense, I'm guessing, a, a, a lifting of the guilt and the load, maybe the regret, possibly the shame that has came from your decision you made um, as a teenager. And the Bible says there is a pathway to that and that is to walk in the light as he is in the light. That is, to have a transparency to our lives uh, and with our husband, with your husband. Um, it may be difficult to share this with him. I can't tell you to begin with what his reaction may be, but I don't believe you should let fear keep you from taking the step you need to step in order to grow closer as a couple. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk about how you can find healing from the guilt or the uh, uh, sorrow that you may feel over having ended a life 
um, earlier. Uh, and, and in this case, as you say, just to avoid an embarrassing situation. I can understand how fear and, and um, anxiety and, and, and wondering how in the world your parents and others would react could have led you to try and uh, take desperate measures. Um, but it was the wrong choice. And I think you would have found as difficult as your revelation might have been that people would have understood and uh, people would have forgiven you. And you might have um, had the opportunity to bless a couple that's childless with um, the opportunity to, to raise a baby and uh, be the parents to it. That is no way is meant to shame you. It's just to say, for, for the benefit of others who are listening to this program, that if you're facing a similar situation, um, do not underestimate the ability of people who love you to love you and to forgive you and to stand with you during uh, what will be a very most difficult season. And there are resources to help you. There are pregnancy um, care centers uh, staffed by very compassionate and loving people who would love to walk with you, beside you, hold you up during this very difficult chapter of life. And there is a tomorrow. There is a time when this will pass and uh, God can restore the joy and, uh, you know, Jeremiah 29 says he knows the plans he has for us to give us a future and a hope. And that's not just true for people who never make mistakes. It's particularly true for individuals who've made uh, choices they truly regret. God is not done with you yet. Well, share that with your husband. Uh, perhaps have a close friend pray for you uh, prior to that. Maybe you'd want to consider sharing it in a context of a Christian counselor or pastor. But I think you will find that when you remove that barrier, the two of you are going to uh, reach a new level of intimacy that your honesty and vulnerability uh, has opened the door to. The next question, I know many women who choose to have an abortion do so because they are single, not married, and their boyfriend isn't interested in having a baby or deserts them, doesn't want the child. In my case, though, I was married. In fact, I still am married. And the two of us at the time, particularly my husband, just didn't feel we could handle another child, particularly uh, economically. And so, with great reluctance, I went and had an abortion. Now I'm still troubled by our decision and its impact on our family. I find myself inwardly angry at my husband for pressuring me to abort this child. How do we resolve this? Well, I think it's important to recognize that you are angry. You had your own role in that decision, and I say that compassionately, but uh, though you were pressured, ultimately you made that decision uh, to do so as well, and I think it is important um, to understand uh, your own role in the decision and take responsibility. But let's assume you really didn't want to do this and you were under great duress and great pressure. and finally gave in because your husband wore you down or you feared its impact on your marriage. Um, what do you do about that, particularly your, your anger towards your husband? Well, it needs to be resolved. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 25 and 26 gives us some helpful principles for doing that. It says this, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak, speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And how very true that is in marriage. Paul is speaking to the church as a whole, but the Bible clearly says that you two are one and belong to one another. And you need to put off falsehood. And falsehood sometimes isn't necessarily telling a lie. It can be keeping the truth from someone, not sharing how we really feel what's really going on inside of us. Uh, we can give the appearance, everything's fine, but that's a form of falsehood as well. 
And you need to speak truthfully. It doesn't mean you need to speak angrily or in a judgmental way or lash out, but you need to speak the truth that this decision uh, and his pressure uh, hurt you and put you in what you felt was an untenable decision. And now you're left with um, an aftermath of emotional turmoil and spiritual turmoil that doesn't seem to go away. And no doubt you're angry. Uh, but underneath anger is frustration. Underneath frustration is pain. And underneath pain is hurt. You need to go and speak truthfully to your husband about this. And the sooner the better. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. See, when we nurse or um, harbor ongoing resentment or bitterness uh, toward people, particularly our spouse, the Bible says we give the devil, uh, in the Greek word, is tapas, which means that we get topography from that. We give him part of the map of our heart to operate in. And as long as he has a portion of our heart, a permission, if you will, which he gets through unresolved anger and bitterness, that's going to cause you even more turmoil. Well, you, the Bible says we, we, we shouldn't let that happen. And then it goes on to say this. Well, what about when you have to actually tell him how you feel? Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit through those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, this is particularly important. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice or resentment. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And so the Bible does call you to forgive. You need to speak the truth uh, in love, which can help produce the reconciliation that you desire. That's the restoration of trust. But there is something you can do even if your husband isn't willing to participate in reconciling, and that is you can forgive him, release him, uh, ask God to take back the ground you gave to the enemy through your bitterness and give that ground back to God. Cancel his moral debt. Uh, release him from payback. That doesn't mean yet that you're reconciled, but it can mean that he is forgiven, and that is going to lead to freedom on your part. Whether or not he apologizes, whether or not he agrees it was wrong, whether he sees the hurt, those are issues that will uh, determine how much reconciliation can occur in your marriage. See. Forgiveness is between you and God. Reconciliation is between you and your husband. And you need to begin that uh, as quickly as you can. Well, let's go on and um, take a look at our teaching segment of uh, this program. How do I find healing after an abortion? Well, one of the most traumatic events a woman or a couple can experience is undergoing an elective abortion. Now, sometimes we think that it's only the woman who suffers emotionally and otherwise in the years to come. But I've sat with far too many men who have wept bitter tears over the uh, pressure they put on or the particip participation they had in their girlfriend's abortion or uh, in, the, in their wife's abortion. Believe me, it scars men just as much as it does women, though they sometimes may be more adept at hiding those scars. Society, we know, says it's simply a choice, and choosing to end a pregnancy for really whatever reason you wish is every woman's right. Yet, all I can say is those who come to our help, to our ministry for help and healing, often share, I don't put these words in their mouth, I don't plant this idea, they freely say this to me. They often say it was one of the worst, if not the mo worst, and most devastating decisions of their lives. And they would give anything to go back and be able to make a different decision. Um, I've lost count on how many women or couples have told me that. Uh, I believe that that is usually the most typical reaction to a post-abortion 
um, trauma, as, as it's called. I think that uh, that is true of more women than not and, and more couples. Well, let's talk about the good news. The good news is there is forgiveness, restoration and peace available through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus died not just for our small mistakes or bad decisions here or there. He died for the very worst things we've ever done. And he did so willingly, freely, and lovingly so that we could know his forgiveness. Jesus has paid our sin debt and no more payment on your part is required. Um, in order to be forgiven, nor to be set free from your past regrets. No more payment is needed. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. It literally meant it is paid. Jesus said everything that we've done wrong, all the moral debts that we've incurred have been paid for. Abortion is the taking of an innocent life. And in that sense, though, and I want to be understood carefully about this, we've all participated in that same sin. You go, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I've, I've never had an abortion nor encouraged someone. You can't say I've participated in that sin. Well, not in the sense that we're speaking about it in terms of having an abortion. But think about this. It was my sin and it was your sin that took the life of the innocent Lamb of God my sin and your sin that took an innocent life. And in that sense, we've all participated in that same sin, haven't we? Jesus, uh, we sent him to die a brutal death on the cross for our sins. And so there is a sense in which we've all participated in that same transgression. If you are carrying the guilt of an abortion, I want you to turn to Jesus I want you to confess your sin. I want you to receive his forgiveness and then renounce its hold on your heart. The cleansing power of the blood of Christ can and will set you free, even this very moment, if you're willing to call upon him. Confess your sin. Ask him to forgive it. Tell him that you believe that the cross has paid your debt and you can know that you are forgiven. You can then hold in your heart and this is not mere sentimentality. I believe this to be true with all of my heart. You can hold in your heart that you will one day meet your unborn child in the magnificent splendor, unspeakable joy, and reconciling love of heaven. You may have thought, I've lost this child. I lost the chance to know a son or daughter, and I never will. Well, not if you trust Christ as your Savior and Lord. Uh, that child is waiting for you in heaven. And as I said, there'll be magnificent splendor, there'll be unspeakable joy, there'll be reconciling love. And all will be made well and all will be made right. For now, rest in the knowledge that your child is in the arms of Jesus and Jesus is waiting to introduce you to one another, to enjoy an intimate friendship and relationship for all eternity. Revelation 21, 4 and 5 says this, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He's speaking of heaven. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. <laughs> and that includes um, making new our relationship with the child or children that we never met on this earth. What a wonderful thought. Uh, what a wonderful thing to look forward to. Well, let's look on to some other questions here, can we? Um, my wife and I experienced two miscarriages when we were young in our marriage. We now have five children. Uh, I have several questions I would like help with. Does the Bible say we will someday meet our miscarried children in heaven? Will they recognize us? Will they be children or will they be adults? Why didn't God let us raise these children like the others that were born to us? Well, there's more questions there than I can answer, particularly in the time left.
But let's turn to a, a very intriguing passage that I think can answer a number of your questions in a very, hopefully, satisfying way. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is writing about the coming of the Lord Jesus when he returns for us. Uh, some interpret this to be uh, this passage to be teaching the rapture when we are caught up with Christ. But listen to this. Now, normally it's applied to loved ones we have met and died, our mother or grandmother, or brother or sister, or whatever. But it, I want you to think about uh, the possibility that this includes, I believe it does, our miscarried children, children who died in the womb or never were carried to term. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. That is a term for um, dying, um, for believers falling asleep, or to grieve like men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we will believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. A child who dies in the womb is a child who falls asleep in Jesus. And it says he's going to bring with him those who have fallen asleep. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, left till the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I believe that we can say fairly and correctly and in context that that can include our unborn children. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. Did you see? Who's the them? That's everyone who's fallen asleep in Jesus to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Well, I'm, I'm encouraged right out of my shoes here. Um, Cheryl and I experienced two miscarriages early in our uh, marriage. I am looking forward when the Lord returns and I am caught up uh, in the air to meet him. It says he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him. And at that moment, I believe I will get an opportunity to meet the children I never got to meet. And it won't be just uh, another parting or another brief passing. Uh, instead, it says we will be with the Lord and each other forever. Well, I hope that that gives you some hope as you consider um, the losses that you experienced in your life. Um, I guess a similar question. What about those children who are aborted or die prior to earth whose parents are not Christians? Will they go throughout eternity without the benefit of ever knowing their parents? Will that make heaven less than heaven for them? Well, that's a deep question uh, to consider, isn't it? Well, let me turn to Romans chapter 8 verse 15, which I hope can bring some clarity to that question. In Romans 8, verse 15, Paul says this, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, or adoption, as he calls it in other places. <clears throat> and by him we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. Now, we're not crying daddy to our earthly daddy. We're crying daddy to our heavenly daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I believe that in heaven, if our parents are not there because they did not believe in Christ as their Savior, we will not be orphans. Uh, we will not be individuals that uh, got cheated a couple of times, you know, once on earth and once in heaven. Rather, we will cry, Abba, Father. We will cry, Daddy. That's the term that was used in Aramaic for children. Uh, with, it's like today we'd call when we were our, our dad, Papa, or Mama, or something like that. Um, Daddy was a very endearing term for a, a, a child, uh, speaking of his father. So I think in heaven, though everyone that on earth we wish would be there in heaven, they may not be. It may go for friends, relatives, others who have never chosen to receive Christ. Heaven will not be a place of regret. I just read a few minutes ago that God will wipe away every tear and there'll be no more crying or mourning or pain. 
And I don't think family relationships will be structured in heaven as they were in earth. For we are um, sons and daughters of God, the Bible tells us. And that we are the children of God. See, see what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the sons of God. So in heaven, I believe that God is our Father will be all that we need, all that we could desire, everything that we need for fulfillment. Well, one more question. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. With the world becoming an increasingly crazy and unstable place to live my, for, for, for a family, my husband and I wonder if bringing children into this world is a good idea after all. If we are indeed entering the period the Bible calls the last days and all the troubles that will come upon the earth, maybe it's best not to have children. Uh, what do you think about this? Well, I have to say the, the signs may point to the fact we could be in the last days. We don't know that. Uh, we, we can't say with certainty. Other generations have felt that they were as well. And, and the Word of God never tells us to quit marrying or to quit having children or to quit planning the future simply because Christ may return or we may enter into that time known as the tribulation. The Bible never says, well, put everything on hold. In fact, um, I just have time to read this from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, at the end, verse 58 where Paul is talking about our hope of the resurrection. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. You know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It says, don't, don't let anything stop you from living the life God has given you to live because our hope is in the resurrection. Well, I wish we had more time. It's gone way too quickly. There's more questions to answer, but join us. Again, next week at this time on this same channel as we look at uh, the questions of marriage and singlehood from the perspective of the scriptures. Again, uh, call us and leave a message on the uh, number at the bottom of the screen. And remember, marriage is for better, for worse, and for keeps.